This is the Voice of the Voter debate with candidates for the 25th Congressional District. Joseph Morelli and Laron Singletary will take questions submitted by the public and by reporters from WDKX, The Democrat and Chronicle, 13 Wham, City Magazine, and WXXI News. Here's our moderator from WXXI News, Evan Dawson. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Voice of the Voter Debate. I'm Evan Dawson, host of Connections on WXXI Radio. New York's 25th Congressional District includes all of Monroe County as well as parts of Orleans County. You see it there. The candidates are Democrat Joe Morelli, who is also running on the Working Families Party line, and Republican Leron Singletary, who is also running on the Conservative Party line. Whether you are voting in person or by absentee ballot, we want to remind you of some important dates. Early voting is tomorrow through November 6th. You can find locations and hours by contacting your county's Board of Elections by phone or by going online. Election Day, Tuesday, November 8th. Polls open from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. November 8th is also the last day to postmark absentee ballots. The panelists who will be asking the questions tonight are seated in our studio now, and you'll meet them in just a few moments. Now, I'd like to share some ground rules for the debate. There they are. Their candidates will not speak out of order, and they will stick to the agreed-upon time limits as best they can. Opening and closing statements are about 90 seconds. Questions will be alternated between the candidates as we go, and candidates will have 60 seconds to respond, and then the opponent, 60 seconds to respond there. Rebuttals would be 30 seconds and are at my discretion. You can join the conversation happening on social media. Just use the hashtag VOVDebate. Let's get started now. We're going to begin with 90-second opening statements. The order was determined by a coin toss before we went on the air. And as we hear from the candidates, I'll ask them to describe themselves for our audience members who are blind or visually impaired. And I'll start. I'm a white man in my 40s wearing a suit and tie. First to give the opening statement is Joe Morelli. Good evening. I'm a white man wearing a blue suit and a red tie. I want to thank Evan our panelists and everyone at WXXI, 13 Wham, WDKX, and the Democrat and Chronicle for hosting tonight's debate. Throughout this campaign, I've talked a great deal about the lessons I learned from my parents growing up. They taught me that if there's something you can do to help someone, then you have an obligation to do it. It's a pretty simple philosophy, but it remains my guiding light and is what drives my commitment to serving the public and finding solutions to the challenges we face. Across the nation, extremists are waging an assault on women by denying them the fundamental right to reproductive care, which is why I'm fighting to enact federal protections on abortion. Families are contending with the rising cost of health care, which is why I passed legislation to end surprise medical billing and bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Every day, more and more lives are lost to the senseless gun violence that plagues our streets, which is why I'm fighting to enact common-sense gun reforms, strengthen resources for local law enforcement, and get illegal weapons off our streets. I'm proud of my record delivering results on these important issues. I want families in our community to know you can always count on me to stand up for our shared values. I look forward to tonight's discussion, and I hope to earn your support to continue serving our community in Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morelli. Now we go to Mr. Singletary for some opening comments. Good evening. I'm a black male in my 40s wearing a black suit with a red tie. I want to thank WXXI for hosting this, tonight's debate. I want to thank Evan Dawson and also our panelists. Tonight, we have a lot of pressing issues facing our community, our state, and our nation. Tonight, we will uncover a number of issues. Campaigning throughout the last year, I've been listening to many residents throughout Monroe and Orleans County. And there are three issues that resonate with many, crime, education, and the economy. Last year in Rochester, we saw 81 homicides, 419 people shot. This year, we have 68 homicides, over 300 plus people shot. We have a cop shortage. The RPD is short nearly 100 officers, and the Monroe County Sheriff's Office is short as well. We have kids underperforming in our, ki our schools across the nation, across the state, and to include right here in Rochester. We need to make sure that we empower our parents by giving them the flexibility and the freedom to make the decisions that what is best for their child, not the government. The government should not be telling parents what is best for their children. We also need to introduce vocations and trades to our high schoolers. We see a 40-year high inflation. Our seniors are hurting, our families are hurting, and small businesses are hurting as well. 
We also have a southern border crisis. We just need not look farther than North Clinton Avenue here in the northeast part of Rochester, where across the country we have 300 people who are dying every single day. And the number one killer is fentanyl that is coming across our border. Just think, Joe Morelli and his party control the White House, the House, and the Senate. If you, if you hired an electrician to fix an electrical issue in your home, and the electrician burned down your home, would you hire him again? It's time to retire Joe Morelli. He is burning down our house. Thank you. All right, our first question tonight comes from David Andriata of City Magazine. Laron Singletary will respond first. Thank you. Uh, I am a white male in my 40s wearing a gray su suit and a blue tie. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. This morning, the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was attacked in their home by a man reportedly, who reportedly had a history of social media posts indicating he believed, among other things, that the 2020 presidential election was stolen. Earlier this month, the Washington Post reported that more than half of Republican candidates running for Congress, 51 percent, either deny or question the legitimacy of the outcome of that election. Mr. Singletary, you were not among those candidates. Historians and political scientists interviewed by the Post said these candidates' willingness to perpetuate the lie that the election was stolen despite a lack of evidence reflected their willingness to undermine democratic institutions. My question for both of you is, do you view congressional candidates who are echoing the lies that the election was stolen as a threat to our democracy? And if so, what sort of working relationship do you see yourself having with these people in Congress, assuming that the polls are correct and that many of them will be elected? All right, Mr. Singletary. Well, I'm going to Congress to represent the people right here in the 25th Congressional District. You know, I certainly cannot control what other people think or what other people do, but what I can control is Laron Singletary. And I can control my actions, my thoughts, and what people do and what, how that would represent them here right in the 25th Congressional District. That is what type of representative I will be based on my morals, my values, and my integrity and the information that's put before me. Mr. Morelli. Well, I think uh, what happened to Mr. Pelosi is horrifying. I think uh, it, it is something that should not happen in America. I'm saddened by it. I'm angry about it. Uh, but we have to recognize that much of this ugliness that we see in American politics wasn't uh, invented by Donald Trump, but it was amplified and created. That It's become the norm now. Uh, in congressional debates all over this country, you see anger, you see uh, vitriol, you see uh, some of the most ugly language being used. And uh, I think we all have to condemn it. I'm disappointed that Mr. Singletary didn't use that moment he had just a few seconds ago to, to be able to speak out. I would be as horrified if this happened to uh, a Republican as a Democrat. It has no place in our dialogue, in our debate, particularly when we face serious challenges in this country. I will say this, that when it comes to working with people on the other side of the aisle, I have done this throughout my career. I'm going to continue to do it. I'm going to continue to work with people and look for common ground. I'm going to continue to fight to make the decisions that are best for America and for our community. Uh, and if that means uh, being able to reach across the aisle, which I've done uh, throughout my career, I'm going to do it because I'm going to do what's best for Rochester. I'm going to do best for this country. Thanks, but I sir. don't think we can uh, ever walk away without condemning this kind of violence. And Mr. Mr. Singletary wanted to follow up there. Go ahead. Well, I think it's quite clear that I think many people would not condone the type of violence. I condemn it. I think uh, as a police officer for 20 years, I know that as a police officer for 20 years, I applied the law, and I applied the law as it should. As a police officer or as a police chief, you cannot play politics, and that is what I choose not to do. I apply the law based on the law equally. Do you think, Mr. Singletary, that denying that the election was valid could lead to more violence? It could. It could. But uh, I can tell you, I have uh, been clear in my response with respect to that question. May I, I just want to add one thing. Too, Briefly, yes. I, yes, which I think the, the decision by many people in this, in this country and the Republican side not to condemn January 6th to say that the violence was like a normal tourism a day, I think that adds to this, that it, it normalizes it. It makes people believe it's okay. Uh, and I think yet it, what happened uh, this morning is another indication. We have to speak out against it. We can't allow this to enter into our politics. Well, the next question is going to come from Cheryl McKeever from WDKX, and Joe Morelli will respond first. Cheryl? Thank you. Uh, as was mentioned, Dr. McKeever, um, the only African-American beautiful female on this panel, so thank you for that, and I'm just sincere. Um, in life, 
I'm sorry. I took that. Off. That's okay, Cheryl. Go ahead and hit that button and start so, again. As I said, I'm <laughs> the only beautiful black woman dressed in pink on this panel, so thank you for having me. Um, in light of the rising cost, um, Mr. Morelli, with food and fuel and heating, what are your budget priorities and how would they directly impact the families of Rochester? Uh, thank you for the question, Cheryl. I, I think mm -hmm. there is clearly no greater challenge for families in our community around, and around the country than rising costs. So I think there have to be two responses to it. First is the immediate short-term response. How do we deal with rising costs? And that's why I fought uh, so hard uh, to pass a bill which will reduce the cost of prescription drugs for people on Medicare, to limit their out-of-pocket costs to $2,000 a year, to lower the price of insulin, and surprise medical billing, which was adding so much to the cost for so many consumers around this country. Uh, why we have worked so hard to increase subsidies to lower the cost of health care for people in the Affordable Care Act, continuing to work at things like the child tax credit, which um, during uh, the short time during the pandemic, we were allowed to offer it, took half of the children in American poverty and lifted them out of poverty. We couldn't make it permanent because of Republican opposition in Congress. But those are things we need to do short term. Longer term, we have to bring jobs back to America, which we're doing through the Chips and Science Act, which we uh, passed just a couple months ago, which is going to rebuild our supply chain. It's going to bring jobs back to America. And it's going to allow us the opportunity to build more equity into the job ranks because we're going to focus on getting women and people of color uh, into STEM courses and fill the jobs uh, that are Thank going to be you, necessary in the 21st century. All right, let me turn to Mr. Singletary. I think it's great that my grandmother will be paying a lower cost for prescription drugs and the cost of insulin. However, Mr. Morelli and his party have also given us 40-year high inflation. It's great that those costs are going to be lowered. However, where is the savings going to occur? They're still paying they're paying $40 for milk, bread, and eggs. So what we need to do is make sure that we stop the spending that's going on in Washington, the reckless spending. People at home don't have a money printing machine in their basement. Mr. Morelli has voted for numerous bills that have added to the trillions and trillions of dollars of debt that we have, nearly $31 trillion. And we're passing that debt along to our children. We need to stop the reckless spending in Washington. We need to increase the supply chain right here, which causes more jobs to be added and more supply here in the United States. I think, though, that what we need to acknowledge is we need to invest in people who will fill those jobs, but we also need to invest in the industry, which are going to bring those jobs back here. That's what we did in the Chips and Science Act, where we're investing in our supply chain along the uh, decision to build more semiconductor chips in the United States. We saw the announcement uh, in upstate New York just a few weeks ago. Those will require investments. There is no way around this. And we need to invest in families and neighborhoods to allow them to meet these costs, but also to have a long-term plan to advance their economic interests. L let me just follow up briefly, and I'll let both of you respond here, because a viewer named Mike jumps in on Cheryl's very good question. Mike says, He's concerned that we're about to see a critical shortage in the supply of diesel, and he wonders if the candidates are concerned that Wegmans, for example, won't be able to get food to its stores within weeks. Do you see that happening, and what can Congress do about it, Mr. Morelli? Well, we have continued to work on the strategic petroleum reserves. We're releasing them. Uh, the supply of, um, of energy is a real concern worldwide, obviously. America has energy independence, but the impact of the war in Ukraine clearly has affected energy prices. We're going to continue to work on this. We're also going to work at transitioning to clean energy. And that means clean energy in transportation. It means it in manufacturing. It means it in our homes. That's why we invested $369 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act on clean energy. To make that conversion and make that transition, we need to do it as soon as possible, not only because of the reliance on uh, fossil fuels and the countries that have reserves that are affecting energy prices worldwide, but because of the, the climate crisis, which is uh, making it more and more concerning for my children and my grandchildren to have a planet that's livable. Thanks, sir. Mr. Singletary, if you want to respond there, too. Uh, you know, my opponent says that we are energy independent. We are not energy independent. How can we be energy independent when we are relying on other countries and negotiating with other countries to include our enemies, countries who do not like us? How are we energy independent? We are not energy independent right now. The cost of gas is ridiculous right now. It's costing farmers who are having a tough time growing the food. 
It's costing them more to put food on the trucks to get to the store, which obviously the end consumer bears the brunt of that cost. And, and, and you passed an Inflation Reduction Act, but it's anything but. It is anything but the Inflation Reduction Act. You passed a bill, and now many of your members don't even call it the Inflation Reduction Act anymore. So we are not energy independent. All right, we're going to get so, back to So I, I do want to know, though, what's the answer then? Uh, drilling more, uh, creating more opportunities for fossil fuels? Uh, we are energy independent. In fact, we export um, oil and gas out of the United States, per, per, particularly liquefied gas. But those are things that we have that oil companies make the decision on where the supply goes. And frankly, we're going to continue to push in Congress to make sure that oil companies don't gouge us during a real crisis around the world. Right, if, if, we are, if we are energy independent, why is the president going to other countries asking for oil production to increase when OPEC plus just said they're going to cut oil production? Because there's a, we are because not, there's a crisis in supply in Eastern Europe, and the president's talking about increased production so that we can heat homes in Europe and those people who are dependent on Ukraine and oil in Eastern Europe. That's part of the reason we are, we are independent, although oil companies make the decision, not the United States government doesn't make decision on how the world markets work. That's one of these things that's a talking point, but that's not how the energy markets work. But we are energy independent. The United States has been for uh, most of the last five, six, seven years. I'm, gla I'm, I'm glad you said it was a talking point. We're because get back to climate I'm glad you said it was a talking point because two years ago when oil companies were making money, you all were quiet then. But all of a sudden now, because it's almost in the inverse, now you're talking about it and right. making it a talking point. 15 seconds point. and then we got to move on. Well, Go they're ahead. making record oil products during a crisis a worldwide crisis that involves the defense of democracy in Ukraine, oil companies are making record profits in the billions and billions of dollars at a time when they clearly could care about the national and the international interests. All right, we're going to get back to climate and energy in a moment here, but let's turn to Sean Lehman from the Democrat and Chronicle with the next question. Laron Singletary will respond first. Thank you, Evan. And I'm a white man uh, in my 50s wearing a suit and tie. Uh, New York is one of 19 states that has legalized the recreational use of marijuana and five more states. Make sure you hit that button, Sean. Are you hitting it? Yep. He's hit, hitting the button there. All right. <laughs> uh, New York is one of 19 states that have legalized recreational marijuana, and five other states have that on the ballot this fall. Uh, if elected, would you support specific measures to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level? I think we should take it off the Schedule 1. Yes, I think we should. We also have to be very careful about the unintended consequences, legalize, the full legalization of marijuana might have, to include right here in Rochester, New York, where we just saw uh, a fellow police officer that I used to work with ambushed. Two police officers were ambushed, one was fatally. So we have to think about the consequences of our actions before we decide to fully legalize anything or fully defund anything, uh, because there are consequences for the actions that occur. Mr. Morelli. I agree. I think uh, it needs to be taken off Schedule 1. Uh, I think we need to make sure that we also allow research into the long-term effects, what the impacts are. Uh, but I agree, and I think uh, you're going to continue to see more and more states move in that direction. Uh, we should also make it uh, pass legislation to allow uh, banking uh, to be done so that we don't see people who are selling be targets for criminals because they're carrying so much cash, something that has not been allowed, something that I, a bill that I co-sponsor. All right, Dan Track from 13 Wham News has the next question. Joe Morelli will respond first. Good evening. My name is Dan Schrack. I'm a white male in my late 30s wearing a suit and tie. Gentlemen, as we saw just moments ago, talks of green energy and climate crisis often show a clear divide among lawmakers in Congress. While there are several measures in place offering incentives for consumers and businesses, some argue more needs to be done. Others say it's hype. What is your stance? And if elected, how would it impact your constituents? Mr. Morelli. Well, thanks for the question, Dan. I don't refer to the phrase climate change anymore. I call it a climate crisis. I think we should all be aware of the devastation of the climate crisis that's happening right now. And if people think there's going to be just a single day when the crisis overcomes us, they're wrong. It's happening already. You can see it in Puerto Rico. You see it in Florida, the devastation of Hurricane Ian. You see it in the, uh, the shortage of crops being grown in California. You see California being on fire with wildfires. You saw Europe this past summer 
uh, literally on fire as well. So the things that we've done, and, and frankly, uh, I wish we were doing more, but we haven't gotten any support from the other side of the aisle. But I will say this, the infrastructure bill which we passed, $1.2 trillion, for a decade people have been arguing about it, we got that accomplished. Much of that is gonna go to clean energy projects. Second, in the Inflation Reduction Act, we passed $369 billion of new clean energy products, uh, projects that will be the greatest single investment we've ever made in our history. We have a lot to do. We have to increase the transmission and distribution capabilities of our electric grid. We have to continue to build renewables. We have to continue to focus on new innovations like hydrogen cell technology, hydrogen fuel cell technology Thanks, and how to deploy it. So we have a lot of work to do, but I think we're beginning uh, under our leadership uh, to finally tackle the problem. Mr. Singletary. I think one of the things that we have to do is realize that there is a process for this. You know, we can't be like California where we're asking the government to tell the citizens to put their thermostat on 78 degrees when it's 100 degrees outside. So there's a process that we need to be involved here. We can't, if the, if the Inflation Reduction Act was so great, then why are we offering incentive for people to drive an electric vehicle? If, if it's so great, they should be wanting to drive the electric vehicle, but yet you're paying people to, to drive an electric vehicle. There needs to be a process in this situation. We can't just flip a switch and it happens overnight, or we'll be just like California. And that's where Joe Morelli is driving us right now. Well. The reason we offer incentives is because the cost of automobiles, uh, electric cars, because the economies of scale haven't kicked in, we don't have enough units being sold. The more we create incentives, the more units will be sold, the more cars are going to be built, the price will come down. Um, we're, the, we're committed to this. We have to be committed to this. It's not my generation, but it's my children's generation. It's certainly my grandchildren's generation. And we're seeing the devastation today. So we have to put this at the top of the list as the existential threat uh, to all life on, uh, on this planet. A brief follow-up comes from, yeah. you'll have, both have time on this because a viewer named Alex wrote in asking if the candidates expect climate change will affect our region. We talked about California, we talked about Puerto Rico. Alex wants to know if you see climate change impacting our region here in Western New York, Mr. Morelli. Well, there are suggestions that it has impacted uh, the Great Lakes. We're building more resiliency. I talked to the Corps of Engineers about building resiliency so our, um, our uh, shorelines aren't eroded further. Uh, it's got, it, it has devastation everywhere. I mean, the, the oceans are rising. Uh, the polar ice caps are melting at three times the rate of the rest of the planet. Um, giant chunks off Eastland and Green, or, uh, Iceland and Greenland are melting. Um, we see the deoxygenation of our oceans, which may not be able to be reversed. Uh, I talked about the, the climate impact on not being able to grow crops in California anymore or uh, in uh, Central America. I mean, these are all things that are happening right now. People around the world need to understand it. We're coming together internationally. But the United States needs to lead. Um, this isn't science fiction. This is science Thanks, fact. Uh, Mr. Singletary. I think we all want an environment where our children can grow up uh, and have a clean environment. Again, there is a process for such. We just can't ask people to go out and purchase electric vehicles that they cannot afford, to include many people right here in this congressional district. Uh, when you talk about incomes that people might have. So there is a process to this. We can't ask people to go out and make their homes energy efficient by unloading and unleashing their bank accounts in the middle of a recession, in the middle of inflation. That we've, I mean, inflation is 8.2%. 8 we cannot have, we have to have a process for this. This can't be done overnight. We can't just flip a switch. All right. Well, I would just say, too, just a reminder, auto manufacturers are not going to be producing internal combustion engines within the next five to seven years. There will be electric vehicles. They have to be built because they even understand the importance of doing this. But what are the solutions? What are the steps that uh, Mr. Singletary would take or argue for? I mean, this is an important question. I'm not sure there is a more important question facing the long-term right. interests so of humanity. Let's give him 30 seconds to follow up then. Is there more you want to describe on the process that you, that you see? I would just say that we need to have a continual conversation and continual dialogue and work with individuals in Congress, and that's just not happening right now. But we also need to understand that there is a process for all of this to occur. We just, people are struggling right now. People have record high inflation that they're dealing with. They're having trouble putting food on the table and gas in their cars. And there's an opportunity right now where we can become energy independent. We can become energy independent and in bring in the cost of many of the goods that people are having trouble paying for down. But Joe Morelli is part of the problem in, in Congress, and it's time to retire Joe Morelli. All right, l let's, let's go back to the voters here. This is a voice of the voter debate. We asked you, the voters, to submit questions, and here's another one of them. Mr. Singletary will respond first. It comes from Sally in Penfield. She says, 
Uh, the following, as a parent, I live in constant fear of a school shooting. What are you doing to keep our children safe and would you consider banning assault weapons? Again, that's from Sally and Penfield, Mr. Singletary first. Well, I think one of the things that we can do is certainly target hard in our schools. You know, as a police officer for 20 years, I, as a crime prevention officer, I've worked with schools in municipalities um, and school districts uh, within my tenure as a police officer. So when we can target hard in schools, we can invest in mental health. A lot of things that occur prior to the shootings, there are a lot of events that occur prior to the shootings happening to the day. I am not in favor of banning guns. The only people who want us to have a ban on guns are the criminals because they want the good guys to turn in their weapons and have the advantage. So I am not in favor of firearms. There are other things that we can do. We can put school resource officers in all of our schools. We can invest in mental health. We can target harden our schools. Mr. Morelli. I, um, we have an epidemic in the United States and guns, 400 million guns in the United States. That's more than one gun for every man, woman, and child in America. These are lethal weapons. I do support and have supported for many, many years the banning of semi-automatic military-style assault weapons. Uh, I, ban I, I support universal background checks for everyone who owns a lethal weapon. Uh, I would ban bump stocks. Uh, I have legislation and held a hearing on um, gun shops and those who sell guns around the United States to improve uh, the uh, oversight by alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the agency and the federal government charged with inspecting uh, gun shops. Um, my opponent has even suggested he be willing to look at making fully automatic weapons, machine guns, allowably purchased by individuals in the United States. I, we could not be more different on this subject. We could not see this more differently. And the idea that we can't, as Americans, come up with common sense gun legislation uh, that improves the safety of all of us and instead would have to continue to add more resources to our schools you, to stop the inevitable shootings that are occurring all over this country is, uh, is just uh, unbelievable to me. Time if you want it, Mr. Singletary. Sure, thank you. Uh, Mr. Morelli likes to take credit for races that have not started. You know, he has said he has sponsored bills, but nothing has come of it. You know, you, you may co-sponsor many bills, but nothing has ever been passed. So you take credit for races that haven't even started. I wish you were very vocal about the violence that occurs on our streets every single day, to include illegal handguns. But what you and Kathy Hochul want to do is make law-abiding citizens criminals. You want the good guys to turn in their guns while the bad guys continue to have theirs. And that's just not right. And the Supreme Court said so. All right, brief response. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't fear law-abiding citizens. I think we ought to have people make sure that they're competent to use a lethal weapon. I think we ought to register uh, guns in the United States like we do cars. I think we ought to end the prohibition on having a database so that law enforcement can trace guns and understand where the custody of guns has been. Uh, the, 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 the problem is groups like the NRA and their influence in Congress has stopped common sense gun legislation. I'm happy to meet people and find common ground. I'm always in, in, interested in a conversation. But right now the answer has been no, no, no. And in the interim, people are dying. Or, or Okay, brief. Yep, go ahead. But, but here's the thing. What Mr. Riley doesn't understand, and I'll maybe take his not ever involved, being involved in law enforcement or not having a career in law enforcement. Criminals are not going to abide by the laws that you want to pass. Criminals are not going to purchase a gun and go get it registered. Criminals are trying to file the serial number off the gun. So, so this if you is use not a that logic, if you use that logic, we would pass no laws, then we would have no criminals, because criminals are the only ones who break laws. I mean, that's the whole point of what we do in Congress, at the state legislature, at city council. We enact legislation to make sure that there are standards and rules about what people can engage in and not engage in. That's the whole point of this. So here's an idea. Force the laws that are currently on the books. Do you uh, agree with that? Absolutely. That's what we need to do. We're no, not going we're 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 to not make to public law abiding citizens criminal. We're going to get back to public safety in a moment. This is the Voice of the Voter debate with the candidates for New York's 25th Congressional District. I'm Evan Dawson. The Voice of the Voter is a partnership among the Democrat and Chronicle, WDKX, 13 Wham News, City Magazine, and WXXI. You can join the conversation on social media using the hashtag VOVDebate. 
Our next question uh, is my own here, and it's on the subject of uh, abortion. On the subject of abortion, Mr. Morelli, you've said that you don't support restricting abortion at any point in a pregnancy. Mr. Singletary, you've described yourself as pro-life. Um, and if elected, I'm curious to know what either of you would support in Congress, either in the way of a ban or not an outright ban, a 15-week ban has been proposed by Lindsey Graham in the, the U.S. Senate, or perhaps different codifications of abortion protections. So, Mr. Morelli, uh, let me start with you, and well, let's talk about what you would support in Congress on abortion. Well, throughout my entire career, and, uh, uh, and, and will continue as long as I have the privilege of serving, I'm going to be a forceful advocate for women's reproductive rights. I don't think there is a more important issue facing the women in this country than the ability to choose what happens to them in their own body. Uh, the notion that a state or federal government would ever require a woman to carry a pregnancy to term is inconceivable to me. Uh, I believe, I disagree with uh, Justice Alito and the Supreme Court in their decision in Dobbs, which I think is one of the most catastrophic uh, decisions in our history as a country. Uh, I believe firmly that the Constitution embeds in it uh, the right to privacy, the right for women to make this choice. It is the most intimate decision that a person can make. Uh, and I am offended by the court's behavior. And frankly, I think most Americans are as well. well I, would would continue, I would vote for the Women's Reproductive Health Act. I have voted for it uh, in the past. I'll continue to push for it. It codifies Roe versus Wade, and it makes sure that in America, all 50 states of America, women are, are free to make their own health care decisions. Mr. Singletary, what would you vote for when it comes to abortion? I would not vote for a nationwide ban on abortion like my opponent has been running commercials about me. I think the worst part of those commercials are Mr. Morelli at the end saying, my name is Joe Morelli and I approve those ads because he knows those ads are blatantly false because I have stated my position on abortion. I think many would like to know where, when uh, Mr. Morelli believes there should be limitations on abortion. So, we'll get there, but, but is there anything that you would support, uh, a 15-week ban, any other legislation that would be sort of national, not state by state, but a federal piece of legislation restricting abortion anyway? I am pro-life, and, and I want all women to have the choices that they need to make, to make the best choice for them, not one that they are forced into. And Mr. Morelli has been a part of a socioeconomic environment where women believe that their only alternative is to kill their unborn child. If we're talking about choices, let's give people all the choices. Let's put all the cards on the table, not just one. And 90 percent of Americans agree that there should be some limitation on abortion. All right, Mr. Morelli. I, I uh, struggle to understand, Mr. Singletary, this is several times we've been together. I'm not forcing anyone to do anything. I think it's a choice of a woman to make for herself. Uh, I, I, we're not forcing anyone to do anything. If, if you personally believe an abortion is wrong, don't have one. If you believe you should be able to have an abortion and that's the choice that you want to make for your family, that should be your choice to make. I'm not forcing anyone to do it. Frankly, I don't understand the conversation. Mr. Singletary called Dobbs a victory. He called it historic. He, his campaign is being funded by people to get today who are anti-choice and are trying to stop not only women from being able to make the choice, but are supportive of a national abortion ban, as is Lindsey Graham and many members of the United States Senate and our over 50 members of the House Republican Caucus. This is the agenda. And frankly, I was watching Sam Alito's confirmation hearing. You'll, you'll find it funny that I watch C-SPAN late at night. Sam Alito, before he was confirmed in the United States Supreme Court, said, this is a settled matter. The Roe case is precedent. Brett Kavanaugh said the same thing. Right. They've lied in their confirmation Thanks, hearings, sir. and as a result, we are now in a precarious position for women's rights. The, yeah, go ahead. The Supreme Court allowed the states to have the power. The Supreme Court allowed the, the people to lobby their representatives, who they would have access to, who they would never have access to, nine Supreme Court justices who sit on the bench, but they will have access to their state representatives. I am not for a nationwide ban on abortion. I am not for trying to take away a woman's right to choose. Again, I would ask Mr. Morelli, when does he believe there should be limitations on when to kill an unborn black, white, or Hispanic baby? Well, uh, let me just be clear. I will strongly oppose a national abortion ban, but I will strongly support women's reproductive health. Every single woman in America deserves this choice, not just people in New York, not just people in California. And frankly, if there's a national born abortion ban passed, which is what many members of the Republican Party want to do, 
even the protections in New York won't exist any longer. You won't be able to get an abortion right. in New York or anywhere else. All right. The next question comes from David Andriata of City Magazine. Leron Singletary will respond first. David. Polls show that Americans are increasingly registering as independent voters, unaffiliated with either of the two major parties. They say they're tired of the squabbling between elected officials on either side of the aisle, and what they see as their lockstep approach to legislating. Can you provide an example of an instance in which you have shown independence from your party on an issue of major importance? Uh, in other words, uh, Mr. Singletary, are there issues in which most Republicans tend to lean one way, but you lean the other? And Mr. Morelli, are there is any issues on which you believe you differ from the views of the Democratic rank and file? All right, Mr. Singletary first. Well, I, I believe if you, if you look at, I mean, first of all, I, I agree. I agree that we should be able to work together. We should be able to go to Washington, D.C., reason with one another, respect one another and bring results back. I mean, for me, I used to be a Democrat just a year ago. And I'm about making sure that we do the work for the people. It's not about party for me. It's about the people. And we talk about the issues. I'm sure that there are issues that I will, if elected, disagree with my party. Uh, but uh, right now, for me, it's about doing the work of the people in the 25th Congressional District. No issues stand out right now? No issues stand out right now. Okay, Mr. Morelli. Well, I have a long history of working with people on uh, all sides of the aisle. Uh, when I was in the New York State Assembly, even when I served as Majority Leader of the Assembly, I authored over 300 laws in New York during my tenure. Every single one of them had a Republican sponsor uh, in the State Senate. So I have often uh, worked to find common ground currently. I uh, co-sponsor 300 bills that are bipartisan in Congress. I'm part of a small group of members called the Reagan O'Neill Club that gets together to try to work across party lines to build understanding, to try to find common ground. Uh, where have I disagreed with my party? Much to the chagrin of many members of my party, I haven't endorsed Medicare for All. Uh, I uh, did not uh, sign on to the Green New Deal. Um, not that I didn't think that there were many things in them that were worthy and important, uh, but I disagreed with the approach. So I will... Uh, stick up for the people in this district. I'll do the, what I think is right. I've always done that. And I'll continue to do that. And I'll continue to work to find common sense solutions to our problems. The next question comes from Cheryl McKeever from WDKX. Joe Morelli will respond first. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morelli, having served uh, for more than 28 years in the New York State Assembly, and more recently as a member of Congress, what is the one initiative that you introduced that continues to make the greatest impact on your district? And how have you measured the, that success? You know, I'll say this. It's a great question. I think a lot about uh, the things I've been involved in. There have been many. Um, I think the thing that I'm most proud of, though, is that when I meet people in the street that I've known for years or haven't seen for years, they say, you still have the same values. That You're still the same Joe Morelli. You're still, you know, part of the neighborhood you grew up in. Uh, I don't want to lose touch with the things that make me who I am, the things that I think uh, allow me to represent this community, uh, the things that uh, I think um, make me sensitive to the needs of people who are struggling. Uh, my father didn't graduate from high school. Uh, he was a pipe fitter and uh, worked his whole life, did incredible work, but was hard worker. My mom was the same. Those are the values I have. That's what I'm most proud of. I think that will leave the lasting impact. I could talk about a lot of things I've been involved in, in economic development and social policy, uh, things to help our health care system. Uh, but I think I'm, I'm most proud of the fact that I continue to maintain the values that I was taught. And I'll have Cheryl phrase it how she wants to phrase it for Mr. Singletary. So, Mr. Singletary, having served the Rochester community for more than 20 years as a law enforcement official, what is the one initiative that you have introduced that has and continues to make the greatest impact on the Rochester community, and how have you measured it? Thank you for the question. Well, I served proudly for 20 years with the Rochester Police Department, and as Deputy Chief, I have created the Community of um, Community Affairs Bureau, where we looked at the Washington Metropolitan Police Department and the NYPD um, Community Affairs Bureau. We brought it back here to the Rochester Police Department, where it gave the community an opportunity to be asked, how do you want to be policed? And what we did was we com combined units within the Rochester Police Department and went out to various areas in the city in a proactive manner. Now, there were times where we had critical incidents that occurred within the city of Rochester, and I used to always say, 
Whenever there was a critical incident in Rochester, when the police cars go away, the crime scene tape goes away, there are still people who live in those neighborhoods. And those are people who are impacted by violence that has occurred, trauma that has occurred. And we would offer counselors, counseling to those individuals in that neighborhood. So I'm very proud of that initiative. And that initiative is still alive well today in the police department. All right, now over to Sean Lehman from the Democrat and Chronicle. The next question, and Laurent Singletary will respond first. Thank you, Evan. Uh, immigration has been a contentious issue uh, for as long as I can remember. How would you strengthen security at the borders while keeping the process intact for refugees and asylum seekers? Well, there are people who risk their lives every single day to come to this country because this is the greatest country in the world. What we need to do is we need to be able to have a conversation in Congress about immigration reform. We need to secure our southern border. There are not just people that come across the southern border. There are, there's fentanyl that come across the southern border. I would ask my opponent to put pressure on President Biden to secure the southern border. You cannot have a country without borders. And what we need to do is make sure that there is a process. There are people who are coming into the country who are subverting other individuals who are, are waiting to be processed. We have nothing, done nothing to increase the time of processing individuals. So that is what we need to do. We need to start with a conversation. And we definitely need to secure the southern border because we have a fentanyl crisis that has emanated from having an open border. Mr. Morelli. Well, uh, every uh, day, that, every week that I'm in Rochester, I go to visit businesses large and small and uh, always ask, what's the thing that's troubling you? What's the thing that keeps you awake at night? And inevitably, it is a question of how we get people to work. Uh, how do we find employees? And there is a vast labor shortage in literally every industry, whether it's manufacturing or cybersecurity. Uh, and so you have all these folks who want to come to America. I agree with Mr. Singletary. He's the greatest country uh, in the world. And people want to come here, like my grandparents did when they came from Italy. Uh, with literally nothing on their back and except the desire to work. We can solve this problem because we need people to work. We have people who want to come to this country and we need increased border security. If that's the deal that we need to make and the compromise we need to make, I'm happy to do it. What I fear is too many people are using the border as a political uh, uh, tool instead of really sitting down in Congress to try to resolve this. I think we can get together. I think we need to get together. And I think there's an imperative. We need to build a path to citizenship for people who want to come here, like Thanks, my sir. grandparents did. And I think we can find a deal if we have the will to do it. All right, Dane Track from 13 Wham News has the next question, and Joe Morelli will respond first. Governmental research shows that one in five children in Monroe County are, and slightly left, less in the city of Rochester, live in poverty. What steps will you take to help families and caretakers of children from what is already in place? Mr. Morelli. It's a, a really important question, Dan. Thank you uh, for asking it. In the first interest, we, we've begun to make real steps on addressing poverty. Unfortunately, we've had a lot of resistance among Republicans who have stopped us from doing some of the things that were most effective. We passed during the pandemic the child tax credit, which gave dollars to individuals with small children and children uh, that are older to a lesser amount. But that was dollars that would help offset the costs of children. Uh, we wanted to invest more. And, and by the way, lifted half the children in poverty in the United States out of poverty by virtue of that plan. We wanted to make it permanent. Couldn't get the Senate to go along. The Republicans balked at it. And the program has ended. And I think we need to go back and reinstate that program and make it permanent. We want to increase funding for child care. Because too many women, particularly uh, women of color, are stuck not being able to work because the cost of childcare eats almost the entire salary of working. So we had a plan, we passed it in the House to um, aid families with childcare, um, and we couldn't get that uh, through the Republicans uh, in the Senate uh, either. That would help deal with poverty issues. And in long term, we need to improve training. We're working on that. We've given more money for workforce development. We work with organizations like Rochester Works and YAMTEP, um, Urban League. Uh, action for a better community to try to improve uh, opportunities for Thanks, people. Sir. I was at ROC yesterday watching the great work that they're doing, but we have to get jobs to people. That will help them get out of poverty, but there are immediate things we need to do for families right now. Mr. Singletary. I agree that we do need to create jobs in this area, and I think people in this congressional district have been waiting for the jobs. And so 
we need people to have livable wages. We also need people to be able to not live in a time where they're paying $40 for bread, eggs, and milk. And that has been created by the reckless spending that has been going on in Washington, Washington D.C. So we can't expect our problems at home to be better if we're not making sure that the purse strings in Washington are being managed. And right now they are not being managed. And the agencies that he uh, is talking about, you know, it would be great if every single person within this congressional district could take advantage of those agencies. But there's not enough money to go around. And that's what my opponent likes to do, just throw money at a problem. He's been in office for almost 30 plus years, 40 years, and we're still having the same issue, the poverty issue amongst children. We can't just continue to throw money at a problem and think it's going to solve every single thing. We have to come up with some concrete steps, some concrete action. Part of it is job creation, and we're still waiting for it. Well, I, I would say this. Poverty, by definition, is a lack of money. So I'm not throwing money at it, but we're investing in families, investing in the child tax credit, investing in child care. I would hope Mr. Singletary would join me in efforts to do that and investing in workforce development programs. Look, there's a uh, there's something that I think we should all be aware of, uh, something uh, that Frederick Douglass once said. It's easier to build stronger children than to repair broken men. We need to invest in people. That's how we do it. We can rebuild families and neighborhoods and community, but it's going to take an investment, and that's how we okay. deal with the issues of poverty. Let's move to another citizen question. This comes from Joe in Rochester, and Mr. Singletary will respond first. Joe asks... What do the candidates see as the federal government's role in curbing local crime? And how do they plan to address the current situation in Rochester? Mr. Singletary. Well, I think one of the things that we must do is we must support our police. I've been saying that from top down. Uh, if, you, if you are the highest elected official in this congressional district as a congressman, what you have to do is you have to use that office like a bully pulpit. And you have to make sure that, one, we are supporting our police. We are making sure that our law enforcement has enough tools and resources to go out there and do the job that they need. And that just has not happened. The other thing we need to do is work with the Department of Justice to find out what kind of grants that they can bring here as well. And we also need to create jobs. We need to create jobs here in this area. You know, it's, we just can't arrest our way out of the situation. The other part of this is working with state legislators, um, those who are helping to try to help people here on the ground. And also we need to call legislators out who are not helping, i.e., the ridiculous policies, less is more, cash is bell. We need to change that system. And you can't sit silent on the system because it's costing people their lives. So as the highest elected official, you are to use that office like a bully pulpit and call out legislators and call out other politicians who are not doing their job. Okay, Mr. Morelli. Well, I think we need to do a number of things. The first is, and we've been working for some time in this, and I believe we're going to start to see some... Uh, real improvements here, but all levels of government working together. Uh, and I've continued to work with uh, the county sheriff, uh, RPD, uh, the city of Rochester, the county government, the district attorney's office, uh, and certainly uh, those at the federal level, uh, the FBI, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the U.S. Marshal, the U.S. Attorney's Office. We've been engaged in ongoing conversations. It's the coordination of law enforcement is really important, and that's starting to happen after uh, really difficult times uh, where there wasn't as much coordination, and we're pushing that. Second thing we need to do is we've talked about illegal guns. We've talked about common sense gun control. That has to be part of what we do. I continue to fight for resources for local law enforcement, have throughout my entire career, and I'll continue to do that. And finally, we have to give opportunity and hope so that people don't feel hopeless and don't feel despair. Uh, and that's why those investments that I keep talking about are so important uh, to be able to get young people in constructive behavior uh, and get out of the destructive uh, ways that have caused so much violence in our streets. All right, last question is going to come from me, and uh, Mr. Morelli will respond first. We've heard some Republican leaders say that if Republicans can take back the House, it's going to be the end of a blank check for Ukraine and their ongoing dealings with the invasion of Russia. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, for example, has said that a blank check might not be appropriate going forward, that they want to have more scrutiny in Congress on this. Uh, do you favor any limits on the ongoing support for Ukraine, and will you vote for any limits going forward? I have not and will not vote for limits. We are in this uh, to the bitter end. Uh, and I hope we'll see some uh, real progress. But uh, what Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation have done is evil. It's monstrous. They're committing war crimes. And 
we have to defend not only the people of Ukraine who have demonstrated amazing resilience and courage over the last nearly uh, year now, uh, but we also have to defend democracy. Uh, democracy is facing challenges all over the globe. Uh, in Eastern Europe, we saw what happened with the Chinese uh, decision to elevate uh, President Xi to a third term. Uh, these are things that we absolutely have zero tolerance for, and we cannot intervene on behalf of Ukraine. They're going to make the decision about their sovereignness. They're going to make their decision about their borders. We are going to continue to support them with lethal aid, humanitarian aid, okay. and we're going to continue to rally the world community uh, behind them. Uh, Mr. Singletary. Look, uh, Iran, China, and Russia are the biggest threats to the United States, to the world, quite even. Anything we can do to push back on their dominance, we should do. That includes either uh, militaristic need, financial help, or any uh, intelligence or diplomacy that we can provide. So yes, I mean, we need to do everything that we can when it comes to those three entities that are the biggest threats to the world. Would you vote for any limits on, on military aid for Ukraine going forward if you're elected? We need to do whatever we need to do to make sure that they're no longer a threat to the United States and push it back on their dominance, whatever that is. And I include it financial as well. All right, now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to deliver a closing statement. The order, again, was determined by a coin toss before the broadcast began. Joe Morelli is up first. Thank you uh, again, Evan, and to all our hosts for your thoughtful questions. And to the viewers, thank you for watching and listening to this important discussion. This is one of the most critical elections in our lifetime, one that will determine the direction as a nation where we want to go. Uh, I often tell a story about our nation's founders. Coming out of the Second Constitutional Convention, a woman turned to Benjamin Franklin and asked, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? He responded, a republic, if we can keep it, if we can keep it. It's up to all of us to fulfill that promise. It's up to all of us to protect the future of our democracy by fighting back against extremists who threaten the progress we've made. This means standing up to extreme Republican efforts to restrict reproductive freedom, cut Social Security and Medicare, and allow them to flood our streets with more guns. The most important title in a democracy isn't president, it isn't congressman, it's citizen. Because a democracy only thrives when citizens participate and make their voices heard. For all these reasons, please, please, make your voice heard in this election. You can vote early starting tomorrow, or on Election Day, Tuesday, November 8th. And I would be honored to earn your vote. Thank you. Mr. Singletary. I want to thank WXXI, our panel, and you, Mr. Dawson, for allowing us to, for hosting this event tonight. For those watching and listening at home, I hope that tonight I reaffirm my commitment to you. I would be an honor to represent you in Morrow County and Orleans County. For 40 years, Joe Morelli has occupied a seat at the county level, the state level, and the federal level, and has not delivered for our community. Joe has done nothing about crime, education, and our economy. Joe claims to care about voting rights, yet he does not want to give black people in the city of Rochester an opportunity to express that right. Joe claims to care about women's right, yet he tried to get a black woman fired from RIT. Joe claims to care about humanity rights, human rights, yet there's a southern crisis, border crisis, at our border. Joe has not delivered for us in 40 years. He has not provided the opportunity nor resources to go along with the hope that we have here. Joe Morelli has not done anything for Rochester. It's time to give Joe Morelli the retirement papers. That concludes tonight's voice of the voter debate with the candidates for New York's 25th congressional district, Democrat Joe Morelli and Republican Leron Singletary. Thank you, of course, to the candidates for taking part. We remind all of our viewers they don't have to do this, and it's important, we think, to get them together and have this opportunity. For those of you who submitted questions, thank you very much. And to our panel of journalists, David Andrietta of City Magazine, Sean Lehman of the Democrat and Chronicle, Cheryl, McKee Cheryl McKeever of WDKX, Dan Schrack of 13 Wham News. A reminder, we'll tell you again, early voting is starting tomorrow through November 6th. Election Day, of course. November 8th. All the information you need is available through your county's Board of Elections. I'm Evan Dawson from all of us at WXXI News. Thanks for watching and good night.